Thank you, Gail. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here. It is such an honor to get to step into this role. Um, Eric has been fantastic and amazing and done a wonderful job with this, keeping this going for so long. And hopefully we'll, we'll be able to, to fill his shoes, but you know we're going to do our best. But we are super excited to keep up with the best night of the week, Monday nights. And uh, I'm super excited to have Helen co-hosting with me as well. Helen, how are you doing? Hey, yes, I'm so excited to be back. It's been three weeks of... Um, N not learning new things. So I'm going to learn new things tonight, which is wonderful. I'm glad to see some, some familiar faces and some new face, new names, new faces. That makes me so happy. And congratulations, Car, for filling in to Eric's shoes. Thank I think you. you're going to do an amazing job. And thank you for letting me co-host tonight. I am very excited. So let's get the ball rolling. Do, 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 yes. do, do, do. I love that we have theme music now you're you're gonna provide I'm gonna that every, just, week, right? every time i host i'm gonna do the do 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 <laughs> we need that it's important <laughs> excellent well great yeah I, you're right let's get going and um the first thing that we normally do is we start with a poll to hear from all of y'all and uh david is gonna launch the poll for us here at the beginning. So look for that. Um, and I'll go ahead and read the questions to you. Um, the first one is, at what age were you infected with religion? Uh, and the answer choices are zero to 12 years old, 13 to 18, 19 to 30, 31 or older, or I have not been infected. And then the second question is, have you ever known someone who got a serious case of Jesus or Allah or something similar after a serious illness, tragedy, or near tragedy in their life? Yes, no, or I'm not sure. And finally, my favorite question of this poll, have you seen these movies? The Exorcist, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Alien, all of the above. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see the answers to that one. Alien is one of my favorite movies. Um, and we're going to talk about that more in a minute. So that is the poll. Go ahead and feel free to put your answers into that. And meanwhile, we're going to introduce what we're doing here tonight in case anybody hasn't been here before. Um, but a little bit about uh, what, what we do here. This is RFRX. And what that is, is this is a show where we have every week, uh, we have a guest come on to talk about a topic that might be relevant to folks who are in RFR. Uh, and it's not meant to be a replacement for our online community or our support groups, but it is kind of a complement to those communities and a place where we can come together and hang out, enjoy each other's company, and get some good advice and coping skills and learn new things, as Helen says, every week. And as always, if you have any topical questions, comments, or we now take death threats as well, uh, feel free to send those to rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. Um, and also, all of our previous RFRX recordings uh, can be found on our YouTube channel. Um, and we are getting those uh, all up to date, uh, and we, we should have them, them caught up here pretty soon. So you can see all of those if you want to watch previous episodes, too. And uh, Helen, we've mentioned the, the initials RFR a few times. Uh, can you tell us what that is? Well, for those of you not in the know, <laughs> RFR is for Recovering from Religion, and our mission statement is, is to offer hope, healing, and support to those struggling with issues of doubt and non-belief. So how are we offering those, those things of hope, healing, and support to people that reach out to us? So, well, let me tell you, because we are awesome with the things we do are Recovering from Religion. So the first thing we offer is healing. Um, basically, this is done through our headline where you can um, call or chat in online and a trained, um, supportive volunteer will speak with you, text with you, talk about, you know, what, however you are on your journey within religion, with doubts, um, concerns, anything like that, fears, and they're just going to offer an empathetic ear offer resources and it's just somebody you can talk to in a non-judgmental way um, we we provide this um, support 24 7 um, in many countries of the world including australia so if you are on the other side of the planet you can contact our Austra people over there too but we are offered 24 7 
um, either through the online chat and phone calls. And if you do not get a, a hold of an agent, please leave a message and someone will get back to you. And you can also schedule a call. So if you are in a situation where you don't, you do not have free range of your phone, you're afraid of friends or family finding out that you're dealing with issues of doubt and not and questions of non-belief, you can schedule a phone call that is right for you. So that is another um, thing that we offer. Also too, we have a resource page which offers all types of resources on different religions, um, different issues that people face within those religions, like leaving cults or you know dealing with like a fear of hell or issues of, or queer issues or anything like that. You can go to our resource page and there's a bunch of articles, videos, books, all that type of stuff there. Now we're going to move on to my favorite thing is hope. So one of the wonderful things about being part of a community within um, our community is that you get to share your stories and hear other people's stories about their own journey within religion and then coming out of it or just kind of staying within religion or becoming a little bit more open-minded. Whatever, Wherever you are in your journey, this is what we offer. And you can do this by contacting with our blog and, and also our previous podcast episodes, which Car is going to put the link in. And this is also going to be in the description box in the Jubilee Do on YouTube. So please go ahead and go into that to find out more about our blog and um, also our podcast on a bunch of different topics regarding um, religion and non belief. Also, too, um, and the third part of this is our support. So one of, one of the wonderful things about recovering from religion, and I can attest to this wholeheartedly, that we have a wonderful support system. And this is done through, um, now that COVID is kind of over, there is more on a, um, face-to-face meetings open up, and that can be within your system. So go to our meetup page and look for a online meeting in your area. Area We have a bunch of cities around the United States. And um, I think there's some other countries on there too, but don't quote me on that because I tend to forget things. So please go ahead and check that out. And you can go to, and find a meeting where you can find, meet other people that are within the same, where you are in your journey and you can here, talk to them, talk to other people. And again, this is not run by a professional counselor. This is just a leader that has been through similar experiences than you are and, and just trained like the rest of our agents. Also too, if you do not want to venture outside, like I like to do, I like being in my house, <laughs> you can join one of our online meetings. Um, I'm a, I am one of the leaders of the virtual support group that we meet on the first Sunday every of every month in the evening. But if let's say you are in Philadelphia and you would like to join the online chapter there, you can do that. Also too, if you are in another state or country, but there's a time and and that and like the Philadelphia chat group that you want to join, you can go ahead and join them. They don't care. They'll accept you and you can talk about your issues or whatever it is you're dealing with. So please check out our, go to our meetup, check out our meetings and please join a group because we are some wonderful people and we want to offer support and healing and care to all of you. So please check us out. Okay, Kara, do you want to talk about some professional mental health people might need? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you for that segue. Yeah, um, as Helen mentioned, all of the services that we just talked about, those are peer support uh, by trained volunteers, but sometimes we might need a little bit more than that, like professional support. And so that is why we have the Secular Therapy Project, which I'm going to go ahead and drop the link into now, seculartherapy.org. And that is where you can connect with a licensed secular mental health care provider. Um, and the way this works is is if they are working with the Secular Therapy Project, they have already been, it's a, it's a licensed mental health provider who's already been screened to make sure that they are appropriately licensed in their state or county and that they maintain a secular practice. And what that means is they're not going to be proselytizing. They're not going to be telling you things like, okay, you know, go home and pray about it. Or, you know, maybe you need more Jesus in your life or anything like that. They're not going to be giving you crystals and stuff like that. It's all evidence-based treatment. 
Um, and so that way you don't have to worry about anything like that happening. Um, so check that out at seculartherapy.org if that's something that you might be interested in accessing. And there's uh, you know, they take your uh, insurance and things like that, or, you know, most insurances, that's something you look at when you when you go on there. Um, so definitely access that if you have the need. And then also, uh, we have our online community. And this is our online platform uh, that we access mostly through the app called Slack, um, where you can meet with other people with similar backgrounds or who have experienced similar things as you and their um, questions or doubts about religion. And we have uh, different groups. Uh, that you can join within that online community that might be um, tailored for you. For example, we have a uh, LGBT group, we have uh, black non-believers, we have former Muslim, former Jehovah's Witness, uh, secular parenting, um, all sorts of groups like that, um, where there are other people who might be um, experiencing similar things or life circumstances that you might want to chat with and connect with. Um, and we have things like uh, group meetings on Sunday nights, um, um, where you can, again, get together and experience that community uh, that some people might feel like they're lacking after leaving religion. But hey, community is something we can do too. Um, so definitely, if you're interested in that, go ahead and call or chat in to our helpline and you'll get connected to an agent who will chat with you a little bit, ask you a few questions, see if you sound like a good fit uh, for the online community. And if that's the case, then they'll give you a link to get plugged in because it is a, a closed group, not just anybody from the world can join. You have to be screened first. So we don't get trolls and things like that. Um, okay, and then uh, next, we definitely want to give a shout out to our good friends at the Atheist Community of Discord. And that is a group that I'm going to put a link to in the chat as well, where if you are out and about um, as a non-believer or an atheist and you want to connect uh, with others in that forum, that is a great forum where you can go and have all sorts of excellent conversations and connections. And they're streaming our show right now as well. So thank you for that. And welcome if you're joining us that way. Um, so definitely give Give them a look. And then finally, the last thing I'm going to talk about here before we can actually get our show started is volunteering. Um, and so Helen talked about healing being one of our, our goals uh, and things that we provide here. And a lot of people have found that healing comes from helping other people. And many of our volunteers at RFR have definitely found a lot of meaning and purpose in being able to help other people through uh, similar things. And we are always in need of more volunteers at RFR. This is a completely volunteer run organization. So nobody is getting paid here. And we always have tons of work to be done. So if you thought that any of the things we just described sounded like something you would be good at doing or interested in helping out with or being trained to help out with, definitely give us a call. And actually, I'm going to drop a link in the chat again, where you can check out what it would take to volunteer and how to apply for that. And again, any skills that you have, we probably have a need for them. It doesn't have to be the things that we just mentioned. It could be tech support kind of things, project management, um, really anything. Your, your skills are valued here. <laughs> so check out that link if that's something that you feel called to do. That was a joke. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. Are you telling me that I'm not making all the atheist money by volunteering, Cara? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if they mentioned your check is not in the mail. Um, <laughs> sorry <Damn it>. about <laughs> that. <laughs> don't log out yet. <laughs> well, I'm committed now. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> no, I've, I've locked the Zoom meeting. You can't leave. Damn it. I'm kidding. That's not a thing. <laughs> Okay, let's get this show on the road then, shall we? Um, what what are we doing here? Well, we're having our usual format, which is we're going to have a discussion with our fantastic guest, who I'm super excited to hear from, for about an hour. After that, we'll do a Q&A session, which lasts about 20 minutes or so. And in order to have a Q&A session, we need the cues, that is to say the questions. So if you have a question during the talk tonight, go ahead and type it into the chat, and we'll be collecting those um, so that we can ask them at the end. And it really helps us out if you preface it by writing the word question, 
um, and then typing out your question. And we'll be collecting those to ask at the end. And then finally, we'll have some closing thoughts from our fabulous executive director, Gail Jordan. And then we will move on to some other people's favorite part of the night, which is the hangout, which is where we turn off the recording and allow people to actually unmute themselves and chat and discuss and continue the conversation from the show or talk about what other whatever other things are on your mind. So without further ado, Helen, would you like to introduce tonight's guest? Yes. So I'm going to introduce our wonderful guest this evening. If you do not know who he is, I don't know where you've been. <laughs> so you've been living under a rock. So Dr. Del Rey is our speaker tonight. He's the founder and president of Recovering from Religion. He has been a psychologist for over 30 years and is the author of four books, including The God Virus, How Religion Affects Our Lives and Culture, and Sex and God, How Religion Restores Sexuality. Dr. Ray has been a student of religion most of his life, as well as his bachelor's degree in sociology, anthropology, with a doctorate in psychology. And that is a lot of education, Dr. Ray. I am impressed. So please take it away with your presentation. Thank you for being here and wanting to do this presentation. So I open the floor to you, my friend. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Can you hear me OK? Yes, sir. All right. Well, I am looking at this uh, survey. It's fascinating. It looks like we have uh, about 20% of our, of our viewers are, 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 are lucky, fortunate. They weren't infected. So somehow you got, a, you got the vaccine uh, early on. Maybe when you were born, you got, maybe your parents vaccinated you. So that's pretty cool. But look at this, over 73% 73, 73 were um, infected by the age of 12. And then if we look at someone um, getting a serious case of Jesus, I'm always fascinated by that. We're going to come back and talk about why that question, um, I asked that question. But 21, 51% have said they've seen people go through that. Um, so I'm guessing if it's probably, it's probably higher because you may have not known that person. You may see somebody and not realize that they got Jesus before you knew him or something like that. And then uh, The Exorcist, uh, that, those movies are going to come back uh, into our narrative here today. But let me just say the bottom line is those movies were written by people who are basically stealing real biology. They didn't make anything up. This, everything you see in The Exorcist or Alien in some form, obviously not identical to the way they did it, could be found in science fiction. Well, tonight we're going to be talking about my book, The God Virus, which was published in 2009, but I would suggest it's just as relevant today as it was in, in 2009. In fact, maybe much more relevant uh, if you look at our current environment, and I think you'll see some of the points I made way back in 2009 have come, have come to fruition with a, a vengeance, unfortunately. We're going to explore the viral metaphor, and let me be real clear right up front. I am not saying that religion is a, is a biological virus. I'm saying it acts like a biological virus. Too many people don't understand the difference between you know, biology and a metaphor. But the fact is it, may, it does act, and we'll see today, it acts remarkably like a real virus. Uh, we're gonna discuss the ways religions infect people, the strategies they use. We're gonna be very specific about something I call the guilt cycle and how all of us are probably in, have been affected in some way by that um, concept. We're going to see how sexual control plays into it. As you know, I've, I've written a whole book on that, but we're going to integrate that with the viral metaphor today. And we're going to examine the special role of hypnosis in religion. I'm a psychologist. I, I practice hypnosis and trained in it. And I've, I've got some insights about what's going on in churches when they engage in certain practices related to hypnosis. And we're going to discuss ways of um, to help and help people. If you're uh, a free thinker, atheist, uh, you know you're recovering from religion in some way. Okay, so when I, I wrote this book, because no one uh, back in 2000s, I saw I read Do Dawkins, Dennett, Hitchens, Harris. I'd read them all, uh, including Russell, and I um, nobody was writing about the psychology of religion. So I thought there's an area needs to be explored. And I picked up on da, Dr. Um, Richard Dawkins' 
concept of memes and mimetics, if any of you are familiar with that, it's not important, but that's that's the roots of what where the book comes from. And I found that the, the viral metaphor is a great conceptual framework for understanding what's going on psychologically. I have uh, upgraded this talk from where I would have done it 10 years ago because we've got some new information. There's actually new science just come out in the last five years or so that is informing the very thing we're talking about here today. I wouldn't change a thing in the God virus. Actually, after 13 years, I would leave it the same. I might add some things to it, but there's been nothing come out that, I, that I'm aware of that would make me change a single uh, paragraph in that book. But you may have noticed that Muslims and Christians look a lot alike when they're uh, expressing their religion. Scientology looks Baptist. It doesn't matter. There's a lot of similarities in the way people express their religion. And we're going to understand why that is, what the mechanism there is. <clears throat> I thought when I first discovered this notion of a, of a virus, a, a mimetic, a, a, an idea that can spread, I thought that makes so much more sense than a lot of the stuff I've been exploring and researching as a psychologist about religion. For, for example, I was trained as a, as a hypnotist. And I, I got through my whole training and I was practicing and, and I was really quite successful in some ways. This was back in the early 80s. And I'm still uh, nominally engaged in church. I'm, I'm involved in a family that's religious. And so I end up having to go to church, of course, frequently, um, even though I, I go to a liberal church. But I have to go back to my in-laws and, and some of my family's conservative fundamentalist churches on occasion. And after having trained in hypnotic therapeutic treatment methods, it dawned on me one day, ministers are using the same techniques I've been being taught in, in my graduate training and postgraduate training. So why the hell is a minister using these techniques? Because I know that minister never went to the schools I went to. He doesn't know anything about psychology. And yet that minister, it's almost always a he, although the, rarely there are some females that are in, into this, some, some women. But so he was using all these techniques and that just blew my mind. I realized somehow these ministers are using hypnotic techniques to draw in their congregations and get people to follow whatever, whatever religion they are. And that could be a Mormon religion, could be a Hindu religion, could be Christian, it doesn't matter. The same techniques I've noticed, the same techniques are being used across a wide range of of um, religions. Dr. Ray, do they yeah. learn that in, in like seminary or how are they trained in that? Do that's, you think? A, that's a great question. I, I will say the answer to that is yes and no. They're actually trained and, and there's actually courses in how to structure mm -hmm. religious worship, uh, worship services and uh, how to incorporate music at certain times. When to, oh. when to get the music quiet, when to raise the music up. And most importantly, especially for fundamentalist type religions, what cadences to use in your speech. So if I say, you are really beginning to feel Jesus in your heart. Praise the Lord. Dig deep down into your soul and find where Jesus lives. And get your pocketbook out. <laughs> Is that why in my... So we're passing the offering plate now. <laughs> Even though I left the church 20 years ago, that Gregorian chants told me, put, put me still put me into that meditative Ab state as a former Ab Catholic. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. There's th So they're not teaching it from a psychological perspective. It's like evolution. When an organism finds... Um, has a mutation or some adaptation within their environment, they thrive. And that's what religions do. When a religion finds an adaptation that works, they keep doing more of it and they thrive. The most successful religions have incorporated these psychological tools that allow them to maintain and compete within the cultural environment. All right. So the purpose of the God virus is, let me just ask you to read that for me, if you would, Kara. 
Yes, absolutely. The purpose of the God virus is to suggest a comprehensive method of explaining and understanding religion and show how it can lead to practical actions on the part of non-theists, spiritual people, and the less religious to deal with religion in our society and world. Okay, good. Thank you. So uh, Kurt Lewin, famous social psychologist, had a famous saying that there's nothing, there's nothing more practical than a good theory. And if you have a really good theory, a theory points you in the directions to hypothesize and explore and, and research uh, or experiment or experiment. And that's what, uh, what we're doing here today. We're constructing a good theory. And what I want you to do when you leave this meeting tonight is go back out in the world and start watching people in the way I'm going to tell you tonight and, and see if the theory fits. You know, see if the things I tell you, tell you tonight seem to work the way I've described them tonight. So um, the exorcist is a great test for the, for the theory that I'm talking about. It, it has, um, years ago, I watched the exorcist I'm, and it looks like most of you, many of you did as well. But if you watch that video, uh, that movie, you'll see this. I mean, it's horrifying, <laughs> but you have this sweet little girl and under the influence of the demon that's inside her and the exercising work of the priest, she starts transforming into something horrible, deadly, scary, all that, all that sort of stuff. And the, the movie really, you know, it's, that's one of the creepiest scenes you'll, I've ever seen in all movie them. And yet uh, what I noticed was it's, it's pretty true. And again, what, what I said earlier, these movie makers have simply observed real human behavior. And when I say that, I mean, uh oh, I mean, uh, I went to, I write, I write about how you can actually do this experiment in, in the God virus. If you are on an airplane, I would suggest you do it in a place where you're anonymous. It's just, you know, you and some stranger. But if you're on an airplane and the person next to you is religious, they've got a Bible, they're reading a chick track or something like that. You can do this little experiment. You can turn to them and you can say, uh, you know, talk to them a little bit and find out, oh, where'd you go to vacation last? And they'll tell you, oh, I went to Hawaii, had a good time. And what, when you're talking to them as much as you can, I want you to look at their eye patterns, look at how their mouth forms, listen to the tone of their voice, look at how relaxed they are and, and the excitement, the emotional expression that they have as they're talking about their vacation. Now, <laughs> once you've got a good sample of their vacation telling behavior, this is important. You want to be very careful how you do this. Once you've gotten a good sample of their vacation telling behavior, then you move to point, I notice you're reading the Bible. Could you tell me a little bit about your faith? Pay very, very close attention at the, for the next three minutes, because that's where you're going to learn a hell of a lot about the exorcist. What you now have done is you've flipped on the, the uh, God virus switch. They're infected with religion. You'll see, their, the, you'll see their mouth oftentimes tense up. You'll see them change the way they talk. They'll actually change the rhythm with which they talk oftentimes. They'll start referring to authoritar authoritative um, preachers or my, my Sunday school teacher or the Bible. So their whole method of expressing themselves will change. Their body language language will even change. And let them go on for a while because you're looking for a sample of behavior. You're trying to be a good observer of their behavior. Do not argue with them. You're not there to convert them. You're there for an experiment. And by the way, don't tell them you did this experiment. That would not be a good thing. <laughs> you're just talking to them. That's all you're doing. You're listening to their quote faith story. Now, at, at a time when you're finished with that, you know, Five minutes have gone by. You're tired of hearing about Jesus. You uh, you see the the uh, attendant go by, and you stop, you know, or you say, I, "I need to run to the restroom. I'll be right back." Or you grab the attendant, and say, "Could I get a warm up on my coffee or something?" Do something to break the conversation intentionally. Break it and give it, you know, three or four minutes. Go to the restroom, do whatever, and then when you come back, you sit back down. You look at him and say, "Hey, can you tell me more about Kilauea?" I want to know, I might go there someday. Tell me more about that vacation. 
So you're not going back to the religious idea. You're going back to the vacation idea. And, and then watch them return to their old. They, they will probably not get back to the enthusiasm they had in the beginning because you've you flipped on the God virus. And they may try to give you more religious stuff, which is a hazard maybe. So in that little experiment, you will see what that movie, The Exor Exorcist, shows. You will see their entire personality change. This is really, really important to understand what we're going to talk about here tonight. In evoking the holiday, the vacation, you'll see here's the normal person expressing themselves and enjoying a emotional expression and re recalling memories. Then when you get to the religion, you'll see this is the this is the infection of the God virus expressing itself as if it's a different personality, because what you'll see is not similar to what you saw. They're not going to have the same kind of body language. Their jaw will not be as loose. They'll be more tense in the way they talk uh, in almost all cases. So that's your little test. I want you to, I told you right off the bat, I want you to go out in the real world and test this. Do with a test. We're not, it's not unethical. You're just talking to another human being. You're just watching them, but don't tell them you're doing this test. I mean, it's that simple. There's nobody's hurt by this. In fact, they may think they made a convert out of you or they gave you their, their blessing or whatever that day. So, and all these movies, The Exorcist is the best illustration of the God virus component, but I'm gonna come back and talk about some of the other movies a little bit later as well. So, in biology, there is a organism called the tox Toxoplasma gondii. It is a parasite that gets into the um, um, systems of rats and infects, infects the rat's brain. And when it gets in the brain of the rat, it does one tiny little thing. It's, a, it's actually a small change in the rat's behavior. It changes the rat's behavior from fear of cats to attraction to cats. Now, the, the rat is still afraid of owls, still afraid of other predators. Almost any predator it comes close to, it will be afraid of, except cats. There's been a whole lot of research done on this little uh, organism because it has such a power to change the most basic behavior of the rat. And that is make the rat want to go out and get eaten by a cat. That's what the rat actually does. Experiments with this show that a rat that's infected with Toxoplasma gondii, you put the rat in a, in a room or a cage and you put cat pheromones in each of the, uh, in two of the four corners and, and some other fake pheromone in another corner. The cat that's infected with the parasite will spend more time in the corner where the cat pheromone is. If the rat is not infected with Toxoplasma gondii, they'll spend more time in the corner of the room where the cat's pheromones are not present. So it's, it's really, a, it was really a simple experiment and it's been done many, many times in, in different ways, but this is interesting. The, the rat wants to get eaten by the cat, but only if it's infected with the toxic, Toxoplasma gondii. What's going on here? Well, what's going on is the parasite can only reproduce in the gut of the cat. So the cat will then be able to eat the rat because the rat is, you know, going to go find a cat to get eaten. The uh, body of the rat will go through and the parasite will then get in the gut of the cat. It'll reproduce. Cat feces will come out. Rats will walk through the feces or touch it in some way lick their paws off, and then the whole process starts all over again. Parasites have, have these very complex life cycles that are totally dependent upon other organisms uh, in, in, engaging in certain behaviors. I mean, we all know about rabies. You know, a dog gets rabies, and they start attacking animals that they wouldn't attack because the virus does the same thing. The virus changes one small thing in the dog's brain to make it more aggressive and to actually attack. I mean, a dog wouldn't normally go out and attack a bear unless you know it was trained to or if it was um, cornered. But yet a dog that's rabid will attack uh, a, an animal they obviously 
would die if, or probably will die from if they attack them. So this is a very interesting biological um, case study. And there's actually a lot of parasites out there that change the behavior of their host. And this one actually has the power to get into our human brains and actually change humans' behaviors too. It can't reproduce in us, but it can get in our brains. And we can have cysts of Toxoplasmy gondii in our brains. In fact, it appears that about 20% of the population in the United States is infected with Toxoplasmy gondii. Now you can, uh, under many circumstances, but not all, and you can get rid of it with antibiotics. But if it gets into the brain, antibiotics can't treat it, generally speaking. And it can get into the brain. And you probably heard that pregnant women should stay away from cat feces. That's because Toxoplasmy gondii can get into the woman and, it, and get through the placenta in, into the, um, into the uh, infant baby and and actually infect their brain so you can it can and and it has tremendously bad consequences for the baby it, it actually may kill kill the fetus so it's a rather serious thing and why women are told to stay away from uh, cat feces so what this does is that reorganizes the brain toxoplasmy gandhi does this well religion does the same thing Religion reorganizes the brain. All these, I could have, I could have called um, this the God parasite uh, or God virus. Uh, I, could, I could have called it uh, the God bacteria, the God fungus. I mean, there's a lot of things I could have called it, but uh, because all these things act the same way. So the thesis here is that religion is an infection of the mind and it has consequences for cognitive functioning and perception including intelligence and personality. Religion impacts your personality. It impacts your intelligence. Those infected with religion stay, uh, tend to, uh, uh, to, I can't read that because the darn thing is covering it. Let me, can you read it for me? Carol? Yes, I Thank got you. it. Um, so the thesis one is that religion is an infection of the mind. It has consequences for cognitive functioning and perception. And then thesis two, those infected with religion tend to avoid or deny scientific or rational explanations for their behavior in favor of the supernatural. Okay. And religion does this. It like says, uh, you know, don't listen to science. Don't listen to your fear of, of uh, cats if you're a rat. And here, don't listen to science, go out, don't get your vaccine, you know, all these things that we've seen people do. I couldn't have, I could not have planned the COVID virus cultural response any better than it came out. It just fit the narrative of the God virus perfectly. And it's, it's just almost uh, eerie uh, and, and scary that people are so easily influenced in these ways, but it's because this infection reorganizes the brain. <coughs> so let's focus on the infection strategies. Like I said, it could have caused it the God fungus, the God parasite, God bacteria. It doesn't matter. All these things act the same way and religion acts similar too. So when did you get religion? We saw that almost over half of our people got religion when they were young. So you get religion when your rational immune system is underdeveloped. You do not have the mental capacity at age five, seven, eight, ten, to rationally understand what's going on. When your mom says there's a tooth fairy, you believe it. When your mom says there's demons in this world, you better believe it. As a, as a species, it's really important for us to listen to our parents. So if our parents says that bush can hide lions, don't go over there or the lion will eat you. The kid 50,000 years ago, the kid that listened to their parents is still alive. Their, gen their genes are still alive today. The kid that didn't listen to their parents, you know, they didn't pass their genes along. So that's what's going on here. You have your, the culture is teaching you what to fear and how to fear it and how to negotiate. And you don't have a, you don't have a rational way to understand is the culture right or wrong? You also get religion when you're under a lot of stress. 
somebody may die in your family. You may get a cancer diagnosis. You may be in a car wreck uh, that you somehow miraculously get out of, any of those things. That, that reduces your rational immune system. That's what I call it, the rational immune system. It's simply the system, your brain questioning things, your brain analyzing the, the world and coming to a, to a reasonably good conclusion that matches the way the real world works. If, however, you get through that car wreck, of course, the seatbelt was on, the, the um, what do they call the seat, the blowout thing, <laughs> I can't forget right now. Airbags. Airbags, yeah, well, I'm a big windbag. Windbag doesn't remember airbag. All right, thanks, Kara, that's good. So you, all the things function, but when you're finished, you think, well, thank God, and then God becomes a part of that narrative, and you ignore the rational side that says, it was damn good that we had engineers that knew how to create airbags and seatbelts. That part of you ignore is, is now, uh, you're, that part of your brain is ignoring it. It's like when people, you know, get out of surgery and find they've been successfully cured of cancer. They thank God rather than the surgeon. So you can see this over and over again in the way the mind is reorganized or if done as a child will be organized to deny science, to deny the reality, the reality components of the world, the way the world really works, the physical world works. So you can get this when you, as a child, when all you're told, well, if you get healed, it's always Jesus. Or you can, you can get it when you go through a traumatic experience like a car wreck, cancer diagnosis and su such. So this, what we're seeing here when people respond in this way is the limbic system at work. The limbic system is the part of the brain that's involved in our behavioral and emotional responses, especially when it comes to behaviors we need for survival like feeding, reproduction, caring for a young, and the fight and flight response. All these things are a part, and they're a part and parcel to the brains. It's a really important part of our brain because without the limbic system, we could not survive. And the limbic system is designed to help us identify what's scary, what's uh, threatening to us, what do we need to be aware of. It's, it's, um, it's actually critical to our survival. However, religion comes along and teaches us. Now, what the limbic system is in our brain early on. You know, it, it develops rather fast um, and keeps developing after birth. But it, your brain does not know what to be afraid of. All it knows is there, it needs a system to determine, uh, to respond, to fear things in the, in the environment. So if you were, if you're a baby born in um, uh, in Washington State in a thousand years ago uh, to a Native American tribe, you, you would not know that wolves will eat you. You would have to learn that wolves eat you, and your parents will teach you that. Same thing true in Africa. If you were born in Central Africa a thousand years ago. You would not know a lion or a hyena could eat you. So you have to learn that. So the limbic system, you are not born knowing what to be afraid of. Your culture has to teach you that. And so the immediate environment puts its stamp on the limbic system. When your parents say hyenas will kill you, stay away from the place where hyenas work uh, or you know, wolves will kill you or whatever. That's the local environment and the culture putting its stamp on you. Now, you may also learn the hard way. You know, you may get attacked by a snake or something and you have, you know, you'll survive, but at least now you know you've learned from the environment and your limbic system will be from that point on primed and ready to deal with that emergency. If, if a lion shows up, a hyena, a snake, whatever. Now, when religion comes along, the church has got to put its stamp on you in childhood. That's why so many churches are hell-bent to get you from the day you're born. Even before you're born, they're trying, of course, aren't they? So you are, you are best and most easily infected with religion when you're really young. And your limbic system is most easily programmed to respond to religious fear messages. The baby does not know the difference between a hyena 
a lion or a demon. It just has no way to know. A child does not know. Even, I mean, much older people do not know the difference. So when the, per when the parent says, demons reside in that tree over there, don't go over there or the demons will get you. Or, um, you know, don't talk to Catholics because they're, they're Satanists, really. You know, they, they eat people, they eat Jesus every Sunday or whatever. What they're really doing is teaching you and teaching your limbic system how to respond to your environment, both your physical environment and your cultural environment. If you have a cultural environment that believes in demons and ghosts and, you know, things like that, you're going to learn right alongside the fears of snakes or, or lions, tigers, bears, that sort of stuff. Fear of hell, damnation, social isolation, abandonment, all those things are being taught by religions because they're stimulating the sympathetic nervous system and it, it's training it. And that's what's going on when we talk about the limbic system. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system is the part that's uh, that is ready to defend you, to, ready to make you run if you have to, or fight if you have to. And religion just simply comes along and takes advantage of that. They teach you all sorts of things. You know, that tree has got a demon in it. Well, your, your brain is going to respond to the tree just as if it were a lion. And the, the limbic system is going to be triggered and respond in the same way. So this obviously could cause trauma. If you tell a kid enough that you're going to hell because you don't listen to your mom or dad, or you get spanked because you're not uh, listening to the preacher or going to sleep in church or not reciting your Bible verses properly or something, you, you could be traumatized and your limbic system is now put into a perpetual alertness. You're constantly on alert because the devil could come out anywhere. The devil could be in the person you're sitting next to on the bus. So you've got to be really careful. So you can see how this whole thing could lead to a hypervigilance in somebody, which is a characteristic of trauma. Now, the problem then is when traumatized people then take that infection and put it in their children, we get intergenerational tra trauma going from grandmother, grandfather to grandchild, to, to child, to grandchild, and so forth. And this can last for centuries the same trauma being pushed down. I mean, just think the whole notion of spare the rod, spoil the child. That's a pretty traumatic way to go about dealing with behavioral issues with children. And yet it's been going on for close to 3000 years, you know, probably 2,800 years, maybe that we know of. I'm sure it's a lot older than that. So that's trauma going on for centuries. So let's look at the major channels for actual infection. I've already mentioned hypnosis, uh, stress. Anytime you get under a lot of stress, you potentially have an opportunity to get infected with the, the virus. Guilt. So many people are, are infected with religion because they, they feel guilty about something. They've been taught to feel guilty. Their limbic system responds to guilt messages. Social, uh, again, I can't read that, dang it. How do I get rid of these things? What does that say there? It says social, social needs. needs. Yeah, right. Okay, so I've got to I've got to have connection with other human beings. We as we are super social creatures, and the minute we feel like we may be socially isolated, and we get this all the time at recovering from religion. I feel all alone. I left religion. I'm totally alone. Nobody loves me anymore. I have no connection. Connection is probably among the most uh, resilient aspects of mental health. So if you're disconnected from your community, your culture, your family, your, your immediate environment, it can have major effects on your mental health, but it also opens you to infection by religion because somebody comes along and says, oh, you feel alone. Well, Jesus can help you. Let me take you to church next Sunday. And before you know it, you're singing, singing praises in Sunday school somewhere. So that's an infection. And of course, sex is another one. I think that's what that says, isn't it, Kara? Yes, oh, it is. Yeah, okay. Well, we won't go there too much. But music, music is a really imp important part because music uses hypnotic, hypnotic ritualistic rhythms to take you into um, certain kinds of uh, altered states 
where you'll be more suggestible. How, I mean, you almost can't find a religion that doesn't use music because in terms of evolution, religions have evolved to use the best techniques to infect. And they've learned that music is an incredibly good way to infect somebody and keep them infected. I, I'm, I'm, I'm an old guy now, and I still miss singing in church. I still miss that opportunity. I was a tenor soloist for years, and I can still feel, you know, if, if a certain kind of music comes on the radio, I can still get an emotional response. It's almost involuntary. Are you going to sing for us? Is that uh, what yeah, I'm hearing? In, in, yeah, in just a minute, you're going to, you ask for it. You <laughs> ask for it. All right. Uh-oh, I'm going to regret this. <laughs> And last, of course, something we've really been touching on a lot already is childhood intimidation. You can, you can program a child and stimulate their limbic system and fear responses so that they get infected very easily and stay infected with religion. So I don't know if you recognize this person. She got pretty infected. <laughs> Sorry. I think she got infected in all the different ways, uh, for sure. And if you look at this right here, this is a picture of Sarah Palin getting blessed by a uh, witch hunter from Africa who himself is probably responsible for hundreds of women being tortured or murdered in Kenya because they were accused by him of being a witch. So here's Sarah Palin taking the blessing in her church of a witch hunter from Kenya. Isn't that bizarre? And yet that's how infected she was by the supernatural ideas that she would, she must, she still believes in demons. So if you think there's demons out there and you think there's witches, all that sort of stuff comes together here in this one picture. I mean, this person came close to being the entire leader of our country. I mean, Trump scares me a lot. Don't get me wrong. It just scared me a lot. But Sarah Palin's pretty much just on the, on the scary scale, right up there with him sometimes. So the hypnosis channel, let's talk briefly about that. The hypnosis techniques are designed to create a quasi-meditative state and relaxation response paired with a guilt message. If I can get you to relax, feel good, and then I guiltify you a little bit while you're in church, then... I can then infect you with other messages, or I can teach you how to respond to these guilt messages. It opens the host to potential infection with God virus ideas. It provides a booster shot for the virus. That's why you have to go back to church. You can't just go to church once, get infected, and never go back to church. You've got to keep going to church because that's where you get your booster shot for the God virus. They don't want you going off track too far because if you get off too far, then you're not coming to church anymore. You're not supporting the church, giving money to the church, bringing new members into the church. So sermon, you, you can find hypnotic techniques within the sermons that are pray and within the sermons that are that are taught. Listen to the damn sermons. The logic in any sermon I have ever heard outside of maybe a Unitarian church. The logic simply isn't there. It's gobbledygook. It, is, it, it makes no sense. There's no logical sequence. It's just assumption after assumption, Bible verse, assumption, Bible verse, assumption, amen, let's pray. It's, there's just nothing to a sermon. And if you want to get online, there's a whole website just for sermons. You may think your, your preacher uh, makes up his sermons every Sunday, but let me tell you, in the modern day, they go to the internet and copy a sermon. They, you pay $50 a year and get all the sermons you want from any denomination you want. It's really become quite a, quite a internet business selling, selling sermons. There's also praying techniques, long rhythmic prayers. In my church, when I was growing up, we, the minister always had the pastoral prayer. That sucker could go on for six minutes. You could get a good nap in during that time. And the prayer was rhythmic, and it, re it was repetitious, and it was low-key. Sometimes you couldn't even hear the words precisely. I mean, you generally understand what he's saying, but it was so low, and it was always quiet. And sometimes they would even play music in the background during the prayer. Very low level, never piano music, 
at least not in my church, it was always low level organ music turned way down. So it, it puts you into an altered state of consciousness. I'm serious. If you go there and you, you're going to be breathing deeper, you're going to be going down in terms of tension. It's going to re be relaxing. You may listen. You may not listen. I, how can you listen to a six minute prayer that you can hardly hear? You can't. So it's, it's serving another function. That's, that's what it's doing. And that's function is to put you into this altered state. There's also within those prayers, I don't, those of you who are younger won't remember this. Well, you might not remember what I'm getting ready to say, but 50 years ago, people just prayed kind of in normal English language. About 30 years ago, there was a type of prayer that started creeping in through the evangelical side. And that was this, Lord, we just pray. Lord, we just asked. Lord, we just this. Lord, we just that. Just, just, just. Over and over again. What the hell is going on there? It's, it, the word just adds nothing to the prayer. Adds nothing to the content of the prayer. But it is a trigger word. And it's a trigger word to, to when the minute we say, let us pray. Lord, we just. That's the way, how many times have you heard that? I'm guessing a bunch of you have heard that. The preacher says, let us pray. Lord, we just. Lord, we just ask you to come in our presence here today. We just do this. We just ask that. We just, it, it is incredibly interesting if you're watching it from a psychological standpoint that it is used as a trigger word to take you into the altered state of consciousness. So now you're basically being hypnotized by the prayer. What he says in the prayer is irrelevant. Um, <laughs> As a hypnotist, we learned all sorts of techniques to hypnotize people or take them into altered states. And the words you use are actually not that important. It's the cadence, it's the breathing, it's your body language as a, as a therapist, it's the um, tone of voice, it's the quietness. It's, it's just, there's so many little pieces that go together to make a good trance-inducing behavior from the therapist. And that's all this Sunday school teacher or preacher is doing, is triggering you. Now, once you've learned that the, the word just is the trigger word, once, once you've responded and your limbic system responds to it, then it's easy to get you to go into that state. And while you're in that state, we can make all sorts of suggestions about, you know, what, what you're going to do with your life. Are you going to dedicate your life to Jesus? Are you going to avoid hell and all that sort of stuff? Now, it's said with a very gentle voice. Because you don't, want to, you don't want to alert the limbic system too much. You're just telling the limbic system, be afraid of hell. But not right now. Jesus is watching you. Jesus has got you. We, he's holding you in your hands. But he might drop you into hell if you're not careful. I mean, you don't want to get too far on that area. <laughs> All right. Of course, we mentioned uh, musical techniques. The musical techniques are these. They select the specific, precise music needed for that point in the service to get the response they want out of the, out of the audience. You, you start, every evangelical, every church I've ever been to starts with a really upbeat music when you first come in. And it's all high, it's fast paced, it's joyous, it's got easy, good melodies. And if it's not the congregation singing it, it's the band up front. So that's the way to start. But when it comes time to dedicate your life to Jesus, the whole mood changes. Or when it comes time for the offering, the whole mood changes, totally different kind of music. They actually, some, some uh, churches can tell you which, which hymns are going to get the best response on the offering plate. We had certain hymns that we sang on, especially on Sunday evenings, that would get people to come up and dedicate their lives to Jesus. And uh, it wasn't the fast-paced, joyous, upbeat music. That never works. you got to have something that makes people really bad about themselves. Just, and here's the, one, here's the one we used. Just as I am without a plea. <laughs> Hope I didn't trigger anybody with that one. That would, I mean, that's the one that would get you to come down and dedicate your life to Jesus. 
Am I right, Gail? <laughs> um, I'm hearing Billy Graham in my head. That song is so associated with Billy Graham. Absolutely, absolutely. And there were more. It wasn't just that. It obviously didn't play the same song every Sunday, but that there were a certain song. They, they always use one of those, say, five different songs. They never vary it because you don't get anybody to come down. You don't get anybody to give money if you use the wrong kind of song. This reminds me of when I worked at, I, I, I don't know if I told, I th I've talked about this before when I worked at the Second Education Center and there was a medium that came in and he played music. And these people were already primed into um, receiving messages from uh -huh. past loved ones. And he started make, playing this very emotional music and, you, and he sounded like a preacher. And I, and I thought to myself at the time, I'm like, he's been taking notes from like Protestant <laughs> preachers because he wasn't invoking god so much but he was invoking love and you know your loved ones care about you and stuff like and using music as an, a way to manipulate people into an emotional state so yep. that that kind of feeds into the same idea yep. of using music and cadence to psychologically manipulate people into a certain emotional state yep and this is scary if you think about it, because yeah. we are we are easily manipulated by these kinds of techniques. And you could be a total atheist and you'll still could be manipulated in some way. And if you don't believe me, go to a damn rock concert and see what they do to you. They get you to pay $100 a ticket and come in there and yell and scream. And how many people without drugs, even how many people go into an altered state of consciousness? Rock bands know if you look at a rock band, they've got a very precise way of looking at the songs they play, the music they play, and in what order. They know exactly how to manipulate that audience to get you into a frenzy so that when you leave, you are going to go out and tell all your friends about how great that rock concert was, and you'll buy your you'll be the first in line to buy tickets, and you'll be buying tickets for all your friends, too. So yeah, it all it it it's irrelevant. It's not really religion. These techniques, as as you've noted, Helen, these techniques are easily they've been around for centuries. Mm -hmm. uh, Shaman have used them in, you know, non non Christian type religions. The dancing of North American native uh, native tribes, those very rhythm, rhythmic approaches, those all put people in altered states of consciousness. And we know these have been around for probably tens of thousands of years. We've got rock art that shows people dancing. So, so we know that the, the rhythmic part with altered states of consciousness, with or without drugs, has been around that long. So here's the deal. A church, a mosque, a temple is an infection center where all channels can be brought to bear to infect you. In other words, it's an emotional manipulation zone. That's that's what a church is. All it's all its purpose is. And if you don't believe me, what do you think of this? If you're a Catholic or we're a Catholic, you probably have some emotional response to this uh, church. If you are a Protestant, you may have a very different response to that church because your brain was not programmed to respond to this particular level of stimulus or type of stimulus. Your brain, if you're an evangelical, you know, this you were taught this was where Satan resides. Now, Helen, you were a Catholic, right? Yes. Okay. I, yes, sir. <laughs> All right. So you and, and you were probably even taught what the different icons mean, what the windows mean. There's probably a lot of education went into what this building means. Yes. And especially if you grew up in a in a community that had a cathedral where they had all this art and iconography, but a Protestant wouldn't have a clue what. So a Protestant would go, oh yeah, this is really beautiful, but they don't know what it means. Their limbic system has not been trained. Whereas your limbic system was trained. So if you're trying to leave this, this religion, seeing a picture like this might trigger old responses, negative responses. It might make you feel bad or guilty or Maybe I should go back or something. All, all those things could happen. But that won't happen to an evangelical. Gail is not tempted. Glenda is not tempted to go back to Jesus because of this picture. But Helen might be. Uh, please I, don't. 
<laughs> my, uh, let me tell you the response that I usually have because the church that I grew up in happens to be a very beautiful church. And I like to visit churches. I like uh -huh. to visit Catholic churches because I find them beautiful. I don't believe in, you know, God or religion anymore, but it's, it evokes an emotion, an emotional response within me when I see pictures like this. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And I know how to separate the two. And I, and I feel like some former Catholics kind of have the same emotion when, when they see things like this, we know that it's all bullshit and we don't want to go back, but it's, we still get a little bit of the emotional response. I'm like, Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, you know, right, that kind right. of feeling. So, so you're, in, you're literally, you're like the rat going to the, the cat smell. Yeah. Yeah, yep. pretty much. Yeah. Because like, because like if like well, like I, when I go when I go to New York City, I want to go to St. Patrick's Cathedral. Yeah. Not right, because yeah. I'm Catholic, because it is a beautiful cathedral. When I go to Paris at some point in my life, I want to go to Notre Dame. Not yeah. because I'm Catholic, because I love Catholic churches. Mm -hmm. I think I find them invokingly beautiful. Do I want to be Catholic anymore? No, right. But, but that emotional response has been in me since I was born. So it, your, it whole, is there. Your, your brain was programmed to respond yeah. to this particular stimulus. Yeah. And, but the Protestant, the Baptist that Gail and, and Glenda were raised, they, they, they still see it as beautiful, probably, but they're not getting the emotional uh, feeling that you get. It's it. There's quite a bit of difference if you compare the way uh, have a have a Catholic go into an evangelical church and see what they get. You know, they're going to go in there and look around and say, this is, these, these fuckers are crazy. <laughs> I've, gone in, I've gone into like a Baptist church or a yeah. Bible, and I'm like, this is boring. Yeah. There's something yeah. pretty to look at. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing pretty. Good. So there's some key elements of infection and uh, we're going to talk about those. Now, how are we doing on time, Kara? We are doing well. We can keep going for about 10 or 15 minutes oh um, damn okay well i got 30 more minutes of work to do then i well, gotta go quick <laughs> i guess we're we'll gonna be it. here late <laughs> <laughs> all right so we're going to talk about two things the vectors and the guilt cycle first thing is the vector all diseases are uh, not all diseases. many diseases have a vector malaria has a vector a vector is what carries a disease from one organism to the next so a, a mosquito is the vector for west nile virus it's the vector for malaria you know all those kinds of things a flea was a vector for the bubonic plague. Um, a tick can be a vector for Lyme disease or Rocky Mountain fever. I mean, all these things we we know now. We didn't know this years ago, but we didn't know how these diseases were carried. Well, now we know a vector is required. If you get rid of certain mosquitoes, then you won't have malaria in your particular area. But so religion functions the same way. You have to have a vector to get from one brain to the next. And so I wanna focus on this notion that the, the, the malaria wants to get from the, uh, the blood cells of one organism into the blood cells of me. They're, they're transferring the plasmodium, that's what it's called, the malaria plasmodium, uh, in, through the bite of the mosquito, and then that gets into my red blood cells and causes malaria. So you have to have a vector and it carries it in a very specific way. Religions have vectors that want to get, instead of blood cells though, it's not carrying disease from one blood cell in one organism to the blood cells in another organism. It's carrying the disease from the brain cells of one human to the brain cells of another human. We're literally infecting a brain. Religion is a brain infection. And it reorganizes the brain, as we've already seen, much like other uh, viruses and things reorganize the brain. Rick Warren is a very famous vector for Christianity. He does not, he does not pass along the Muslim disease. He doesn't pass along the Mormon disease. He passes along the very specific disease that he carries in his own brain. We rarely, it's almost impossible for someone to carry two of these diseases in their brain. You can't have a Protestant Catholic brain. One of those diseases gets in the brain and takes over the whole brain. Uh, some viruses act that way too. There's some viruses 
that will prevent other viruses from getting in. We just learned this week that smallpox vaccine can prevent monkeypox just this week. So viruses have a way of getting rid of the competition, if you will. And so we have the cowpox uh, was, was a um, well-known disease of uh, milkmaids in the 1700s. And William, William Jennings uh, discovered that a cowpox inoculation um, that, that milkmaids never got smallpox because something about the cowpox prevented smallpox. So again, we got an example of a virus, one virus preventing another virus from getting in. Religions do the same thing. Those Protestants out there are teaching that Catholics are not true Christians. I mean, Gail, were you taught that? Catholics aren't true Christians? Catholics and, and, and Mormons too. Oh yeah, the Mormons aren't true Christians. And the Mormons are being taught that the Baptists and the Catholics aren't true either. So what it's doing is doing exactly what the monkeypox does or the cowpox. It's preventing another virus, God virus in this case, from infecting that brain. Because the, the God virus does not want competition. It wants to own your brain. Once I own your brain, then I can use your brain to go into the next brain. Generally speaking, my children. That's where the infection is going to go. And you get all sorts of viral uh, of vectors, which a Catholic priest is just another vector. An elder of the Mormon church is another vector. A Baptist minister, a evangelical minister like Ted Haggard is just a vector. Now, here's the thing. Vectors are very, very expensive. It takes a long time to develop a Catholic priest, minimum eight years. So you've got eight years of investment in something. You can't replace that. It's very difficult to get a new vector. So if the vector fucks up in some way, you know, like rapes little children, then let's make sure he doesn't get sent to prison because he's hard to replace. Let's protect him and deny, you know, the claim of the child or the parents or whoever's saying that the priest was um, committing a crime, basically. A successful vector, the more successful a vector is, the bigger the protection scheme is around him or her. And a less successful vector is going to get um, have less protection. So when you see there was a there was a video uh, just last week I saw it of a woman, incredibly brave woman. I, I just I was just in awe when I watched this YouTube video. She went up on the stage. The, her minister stood up and apologized in a non-apology way about having sinned and you know had an affair and that bullshit. Well, this woman, he said, I ain't putting up with that. And she went up there in front of the microphone, basically said, you raped me and you won't even admit it. Her husband stood by her and they, they pretty much told the whole story and what he was not confessing to. And then when she left, very few people followed her. Very few people said anything to her. They ignored her. But they all gathered around the minister and protected him and said, oh, it's not your fault, you know, all this. She's the evil person for having told the truth. You're our, so that's what you see. The vectors get protected. That's what we just saw this last couple of weeks on the Baptist church. How many thousands of people, children, women were, were uh, abused and taken advantage of by Baptist ministers. And it, it's over the last 20 or 30 years. And they're just now reporting on it. And they've never done anything about it. And they still aren't claiming they will do anything about it. They, they look, I was listening to NPR today. They're going from 1945 to 2020. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, they're going <laughs> all the way back there. Uh, so I'm, yeah. I'm guaranteeing you it's been going on for a hell of a lot longer than that. Yeah, but they're going back to the 1940s. I think that was the cat. Because that's, that's where most people were alive. And then that's, up that's, to 2020. That's good. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't... Um, it doesn't even come close to the tip of the iceberg. When we say the tip of the yeah. iceberg, that's that's an understatement. The Catholic Church has been raping people uh, literally and figuratively for centuries. That and was nobody... my nail in the coffin moment. Was yep. the Catholic yep. abuse scandal? That was the made me, that was the thing that made me leave. And you look at the Catholic report in Australia and the Jehovah's Witness report in Australia, the, the Catholic report in uh, Ireland. I mean, these things are just. 
go, some of these reports now are, are probing clear back 100 years. You look at the Magdalenas of Ireland where hundreds and hundreds of, of babies were thrown into a well in the Magdalenas from unwed mothers. I mean, these things are almost unimaginably horrible. And yet the vectors were protected. It's hard to replace a, a priest. It's hard to replace a nun in the Catholic Church. So can so, I ask a question? Yeah. So why do you think when these allegations come out about the sexual abuses and the physical abuse and the emotional abuse, why do people stay? Their limbic system has been programmed. And it's just as I mentioned, I've talked about earlier, their brain has literally been programmed to respond to certain threats. At once they, they've been taught from their very small, the priest, the minister or the priest is the most important person in our lives. We always respect him. We never question him. I mean, you, you do not question the minister. You do not question the priest. I, I was told that very early on in my church. Well, when you see them being questioned, the only answer your brain can come up with is the person doing the questioning is the evil person because God incarnate and incarnate is in that priest or in that mm -hmm. minister. He speaks for God. You cannot question God. So you can see how this power dynamic comes out. It is almost beyond comprehension that I could question God. I could question the minister. And yet, and so then when I see somebody questioning, my tendency is to stand by the minister. And that's what you see. I mean, the, what I'm telling you and, and showing you the pattern, it is universal. And it, it, we have examples of this in Buddhism, Buddhist monasteries abusing young boys for centuries. Sa the same thing in Hindus, same thing in Mormons. It's, it's irrelevant that with the... It's same thing in, in Muslims. There's all sorts of Muslim sex scandals that are rarely reported. So anyway, that's that's the long answer to your short question. <laughs> so I want to talk about the guilt cycle because this pertains to you. Here's the way the guilt cycle works. You are taught by your mother, don't eat the cookies before supper. And you get, you, you are kind of hungry, you like cookies. So you put your hand in the cookie jar and you take a cookie out and your mom catches you, she slaps your hand, she says, don't do that again. So now you've learned the rule, do not eat cookies before supper. So what happens is the next time you're hungry and there's a cookie jar, you're really, really tempted. Mom's not watching. So you stick your hand in the cookie jar, you get the cookie, mom never finds out. But you start feeling a little twinge of guilt because you've broken the rule. So you feel guilt, and this is the guilt cycle. You've, you, you feel hungry, you steal a cookie, you feel guilty about it. That's the guilt cycle. Well, come along, the religious guilt is, has to be taught. And guilt cycle is the same thing with religious. You, you have to do, you, religion puts you into a double bind. Religion gives you a commandment. Thou shalt not masturbate. So very few people can resist masturbating, sexually pleasuring themselves when they're adolescents, for sure. So they masturbate, and then they feel guilty about masturbating. Now, how do you get rid of the guilt? You go confess to the priest, or you read the Bible, or you pray. You do something to get rid of the guilt that you were taught. And you have you ever heard of a Catholic going to a Baptist minister to confess their sins? Have you ever heard of a Mormon confessing their sins to a Catholic priest? No, you don't. You, you can't get rid of the guilt unless you go back to the place that taught you the guilt. So Mormons teach a certain kind of guilt, and then they teach the method for relieving the guilt. Baptists do the same thing. Catholics do the same thing. Every religion teaches a guilt cycle, and then it says, oh, and when, if you want to get away from this horrible guilt we've we taught you, you come back to us and we'll, we'll let you pray about it, we'll let you meditate, we'll let you read the Bible, we'll let you go to the Sunday, we'll let you do something, give more money, and you can get rid of, of the guilt. Of course, you have to ask forgiveness, 
And then what happens? You do it again. You know, you masturbated once this week, you do it again, and now you're really in trouble because you promised Jesus you wouldn't do that again. So guilt plays right into the whole cycle of bringing you back to Jesus. So you see the guilt cycle here. What religion does is it comes in and says, we're going to teach you the guilt, and now, but you can come to us for forgiveness. When you get forgiveness, you have a big sigh of relief. Ah, oh, I've been forgiven by Jesus. Praise the Lord. Well, the next time you feel guilty, now you know where to go. You go back to Jesus. It keeps you in the religion. The guilt cycle keeps going over and over and over again, thousands of times in one lifetime. And it keeps you from leaving and becoming a Catholic or becoming a Baptist or leaving religion altogether because you got to come back to the place you learned the guilt. Now, here's where I start singing. Be careful here. You ask for it. I've already sang once, but think about this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. What is the message of that music? Beautiful music, horrible psychological message. You're a worthless piece of shit, basically. And if you don't come to Jesus, you're going to pay for it. Now, I always like to point out the man who wrote this song was a mass murderer. Most people do not know this, but the, the author of this song was a slave ship owner who transported human beings from Africa to, to the Western Hemisphere, sold them for his own profit, went back to England, and at one point in time, he got Jesus. When he got Jesus, he waited about another three years till he could get his finances in order and uh, you know, then, then stop the uh, slave trade. Isn't that interesting that one of the most popular religious songs we've got, how many people died on the transition between Africa and the Western Hemisphere? Because of him. I consider him a mass murderer. But he, he, he got Jesus and he stopped being a slave trader because of Christianity. I won't, I won't deny that. But he never, he never admitted he was a mass murderer. And nobody thinks about a mass murderer wrote this song. Uh, I don't care whether you repented or not. You're still a mass murderer. You know, if, if this person got Allah, if he had gotten Allah, would that change your mind about his behavior? Or what if he never, what if he simply left slave trade and never did anything, never got Jesus, never got Allah? Would he, would that change it? Those things should not change it. He is still a fucking mass murderer in any reasonable, rational book. Anyway, uh, I could go on. on. I, I'm on my, I'm, I'm in my preaching mode now, Kara. So look out. <laughs> All right. I was, I was feeling hypnotized. <laughs> All <working>. right. <laughs> so here's what uh, Butch Hancock says. Life in Lubbock, Texas taught me two things. One, that God loves you and you're going to burn in hell. The other is that sex is the most awful, dirty thing on the face of the earth, and you should save it for someone you love. So that's the way the God virus works. It teaches you guilt and shame about your own body, and then it gives you some stupid idea about how you can get over that guilt and shame. So most God virus are consumed with sex. You can't hardly have Christianity without sex negative ideas I, I don't even know how you do it so what's the purpose the purpose is to create a guilt pathway for infection because religions of all kinds have learned that guilt and shame of your own body is the best way to get you infected and keep you infected with a specific religion that's why virtually every religion uses it <clears throat> with very few exceptions maybe paganism maybe wicca but those aren't christian for sure but certainly Islam and Christianity and Buddhism is very sex negative. Don't let anybody tell you Buddhism is enlightened. It's, it's as bad as any other religion in many ways. Uh, it, the, one of the main functions is to protect them and maintain the unit of the family. That's why you're supposed to raise your children in the ways of the Lord and they will follow forever. What's that Bible verse? And if this doesn't work, you are obligated, even religions that say, 
divorce is immoral, divorce is forbidden, they still are happy when you divorce your atheist spouse. So there's not really a problem with divorce if it, does, if it keeps the God virus, uh, protects the God virus in your brain and maybe in your children's brain. So that's, that's a big part of what guilt is all about and shame. I've already talked a little bit about it. I'm going to move on because I'm running out of time. Can you even imagine a religion without a sex negative environment? Like I said, Wicca, Pagan, I'm going to give them, I'm going to give them a slide there. But I can't think of hardly any other religion, maybe Unitarians for sure. Uh, but most religions thrive in a sex negative environment. And here's the deal. Almost all parasites, bacteria, viruses, rearrange the host to make the body of the host more comfortable for them. There's, there's all, sorts, <laughs> all sorts of organisms that, there's one organism that infects crabs and then castrates the male crab and, and uh, takes away the genitals of the female crab and then lives off the crab, doesn't kill the crab, but lives off the crab while it reproduces. That's a pretty major modification. And there's all sorts of parasites that do this. Well, think about it. Religion modifies our sexual behavior dramatically. And so we start behaving like the religion tells us to. Purity culture, which we've heard a lot about in, in the RFRX, is a great example of that. It makes you behave in ways that are unnatural in the interest and propagation of the parasite. Just like that parasite that takes the gonads away from the crab does it to, in the interest of the parasite, not of the crab. So guilt, guilt could be around all sorts of things, but religion has found that food and sex are great ways to make you feel guilty. Have you ever noticed that some religious ideas can really get under your skin? If you're a Jehovah's Witness, certain things can really get you going if it comes out of the Jehovah's Witnesses. But when you hear it from a Catholic, that's just crazy. You know, you don't even think about it. It's, it's not, doesn't get under your skin. That is evidence that you still hold part, parts and particles of the God virus inside of you. You may have been an atheist for 50 years, but if you still get pissed off about a certain song you hear, that you were raised with in the Baptist church, that may say you still got some of that particle of the virus. All right, I'm gonna move way past this. Um, I'm just gonna, this is a comparison. We don't need to spend any time on it. So when you observe religion in the future, I want you to use these concepts to better understand what's actually happening. Once you understand the role of hypnosis, the role of ritual, role of, of uh, rhythmic, ideas, the role of music, all the stuff we've talked about, you could go back to your old church and do a full analysis. Just take a notebook with you and do a full analysis of what's going on. Why did they play that piece of music right at that specific time? How did they get, how many people came forward and which piece of music were they playing? How did the preacher preach? Did he use the word just? You know, there's a lot of things we've talked about here today. You can now go back and it'll help you disassociate from the Olympic system programming that you had, because there is incredible hope here. You can reprogram your Olympic system. You're not a victim of that religion the rest of your life, but you have to start somewhere. And that's why I wrote this book. That's why I'm doing this talk. I want people to learn how to reprogram themselves by getting better at watching how the whole system works, because I think that helps you become a better observer of actual reality. You're, re, you're, re, you're realistically watching a religious induction when you go into your Catholic mass or you go into a Baptist praise service, any, any of that stuff. So you can make a difference and that's what we're all about here at um, Recover From Religion. And you can make a difference just by volunteering for us, by supporting us, by letting people know about us, you can help people know that we can, we can support you as you make your own choices in your own journey. We're very, we're very, very high on meeting you where you are in your journey. We do not give a damn where you go. That's your business, not ours. 
go find another religion if you want go back to religion create your own religion i don't care but we'll help you wherever you're at and we want you to know we're always here for you our volunteers are among the best on the planet so um religion does everything it can to keep people from leaving and those who do leave oftentimes feel alone they left out of society and we want to change that by creating a safe place for people who want to recover from religion. So you become a volunteer or go online and donate and whatever you can do to help us. We always appreciate your support. So I am finished and happy to take a few questions. I'm going to stop sharing right now. Excellent. Thank you so much. I always love your presentations about this topic, um, as well as your other book. <laughs> um, it is so timely, like you said, and we've all been thinking a lot about viruses lately. So yes, we do have a few questions um, here. And as a reminder to everyone, if you do have a question for Dr. Ray, go ahead and drop it in the chat now. We'll try to get to as many as we can um, before we run out of time. But yes, thank you so much. And we do have some questions. Um, the first one that someone posed is, they're wondering, do you think people are predisposed to attributing completely natural things to the supernatural, or is it mostly upbringing? Uh, I think there's both components there. Upbringing is a, obviously an important component because where you're, up where you're brought up makes a big difference. If you, same person with the same genes brought up in Saudi Arabia is not going to become a Christian. They're going to become a Muslim, of course. So upbringing is really important. But on the other side, um, and this is a whole lec I could do a whole lecture on this alone, are personality variables. There are, it's pretty clear that there are certain personality types that are more susceptible to religious infection than others. Uh, for example, there are five, and I don't have time to do all this, but there are five personality components in humans. One of those is openness to new experience and curiosity. If you, if I could give you a personality test and you score high on openness to experience and curiosity, you are very unlikely to get infected with religion or stay infected with religion. If you score low on openness to new experience, you're much more likely to be infected with a religion or more easily infected and you will stay infected the rest of your life in all likelihood because there are personality variables that religion has learned how to take advantage of they haven't figured out how to infect scientists so i mean think about that scientists score among the highest on openness to new experience and curiosity so you're not going to get a uh, fundamentalist baptist scientist most i mean it's pretty rare if it, if it does also think about this people who are rock climbers climbing up uh in yosemite ask them what religion they are and they'll say i'm the religion of nature you you, you almost you never find a fundamentalist climbing up yosemite it just doesn't seem to happen because their openness to new experience and curiosity i mean if you're open to new experiences like climbing a rock that could kill you, I'm thinking you'd score pretty high in that area. Is that, you think that answers that question, Kara? Yeah, I think it does, actually. I, I like that a lot. Um, that's that's a good way to put it. And I, I can see that now that you're mentioning that, that tracks with my experience with some of the most, you know, entrenched religious uh, people in my life. They are absolutely not people who are open to new experience <laughs> oh, oh no you can't and you can't give them a journal article and say well this journal article disputes no they want to get whatever their preacher said oh yeah i had a i had a physician once tell me when we got into a discussion says i a physician okay you'd think he'd but he said i don't i don't believe all that evolution stuff i, I believe what my my preacher tells me okay you had to go all the way through medical school so he is the exception you don't find yeah. many of those but no yeah, Ooh, so that would bother me. There's four. <laughs> other, well, not my doctor. I'll tell you that there was four other personality characteristics, and a couple of them are much more highly susceptible. But mm -hmm. we that we'll save that for another day. Okay, it sounds like we got another episode brewing with uh, with some of that. <laughs> All right, uh, Helen, do you want to do the next question? 
Sure. Um, why do you want, when did the metaphor of virus first start being used for concepts or ideas catching on with others? Good question. Uh, that goes back to uh, Dr. Richard Dawkins wrote a book called The Selfish Gene in 1975, I believe it came out. It's a, it was a groundbreaking book because it covered areas of biology and an angle of genetics that nobody had ever conceived of. Uh, and it really challenged uh, a more mainstream Darwin um, evolutionary behavioral uh, narrative as well. And it, I mean, it didn't overturn evolution or anything like that, I'm, but it gave a different angle, a different understanding. One chapter in that book is uh, on memes. And, and what Dawkins said is a, a gene and a meme. Think about this. A, a gene is a short strand of DNA that impacts the organism in a very specific way. A meme is a short strand of culture that moves and impacts the brain in a certain way. So you got a gene that gives you red hair. You got a meme that can get between my brain and your brain, much like a gene gets between my body and my children's body. And then that meme makes me uh, believe something or do something. It makes me think there are demons under that bush, for example, that would be a meme. A meme is a unit of culture. Uh, and I'm, I'm giving you the elevator speech here. It's very short, but so that notion of a meme was brought forward in 1989 when Dr. Dawkins wrote another, wrote an essay and published it called Viruses of the Mind. And he said, and that's where he used his mimetic notion that, from the book and said, well, memes are everywhere. And there's, there's good memes, there's bad memes, there's parasitic memes. So if you think about it, a Mormon, Mormonism is a, is a cluster of memes. It's a group grouping. Catholicism is another grouping, very different grouping of memes. Islam, another grouping. And those memes can come and go within the, the framework of the religion. So that allows for these meme clusters a meme, a meme plex, if you will. Catholicism is a meme plex. And some of those memes come and go. I mean, saints, for example, saints are a, a meme within Catholicism, but you could have saints that come and go and become more or less important. And, and religions are constantly evolving and changing. I mean, women being able to wear pants in a Baptist church is fairly new. You couldn't do that 40, 50 years ago. That meme of dress, is that's another meme. It's a unit of culture. That, that's the short version of where it all came from. Roughly came from the, from the essay, Viruses of the Mind, 1989, Richard Dawkins. Yeah, okay, very interesting. Um, and along those lines, uh, I'm gonna segue to a, another question we had. Um, are there any other books, I mean, other than yours, uh, that you would recommend on religion if people want to read further about this kind of thing? Uh, there's actually quite a few. Um, <laughs> I just I literally had somebody uh, email me or text me uh, yesterday, Hector Garcia, who's actually been on this, um, this show. He emailed me uh, or texted me and said, did you know your, your book, you and your book are cited in the book of uh, the ape that understood the universe. <laughs> uh, I, this is a little bit off topic, but I was also, I got to talking about this with a friend of mine yesterday. And I, uh, if you've ever read, read um, Dan Brown's book, um, Angels and Demons or the Da Vinci Code. I read what, all three of those books. <laughs> okay. Then, okay, then you probably don't remember though that he mentions in one spot, he mentions five books that influenced him. He's sitting in his library and he mentions five books that mention, and the God virus is one of them. Yes. <laughs> That's awesome. I love I, it. I had no idea. So I have now made it into fiction. I've also made it into science. Anyway, yes, there are quite a few books. I, I actually, many people have not, even though they haven't taken the God virus in the same way that I do it which is, that's fine. 
Dr. Hector Garcia's books on uh, that he's talked about here are excellent and they're great. They're great um, um, si uh, siblings, I guess to, you could say to the God virus. They take a component and, and, and add to it or uh, Dr. Jack Wathy, who's also been on this show, his books are also, and he, you know, he actually cites the God virus in his, but his books on, uh, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting books names right now, but yes, there are many books out there. I mean, I would say Richard Dawkins, not Richard Dawkins, but um, gosh, Sam Harris probably was one of the early starters. There was a couple of books before this. I think Bertrand Russell's book, Why I'm Not a Christian, phenomenal book i would attribute that to my that book alone is probably the major one that took me into atheism but it was written back in like 1949 it's written about the time i was born so it's, it's been around a while so who knows when this all started but sam harris kind of started this new wave of of questioning religion and uh in 19 so since that time there's been a snowball of books exploring different components and the God virus just is one component. I, I don't think I'm the answer to all of, of it, but, um, but you know, it's a central theme about viral metaphors. Um, I have another question. <laughs> so how can people reject a religious claim, but still believe in supernatural things like ghosts or psychics or anything like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, there's some personalities that are just, they just are attracted to that stuff. And... <sighs> It'll always be with us. And the reason I say that is those personalities are not scientifically interested. They're not interested in science. They're not interested in how the real world works. It's, you know, they could be some of the greatest artists. I, you know, just because you're not scientifically minded doesn't mean you don't have incredible talents to give to the world, but they may still, I mean, I know some people are really, really good artists that believes that their spirit horse teaches them how to draw, okay? Um, I don't know what a spirit horse is, but that's what they told me. They're not Christian, obviously. <laughs> and I, I love this person. They're, they're great. They're a, they're a wonderful human being, but they think I'm a nut because I believe in science, okay? They did get a vaccine for the COVID only after a, one of their friends died of it. And I said, look, this shit is real. And I told her that, and your your friend died, your friend died of it. Maybe you should reconsider your stance on this. And she did, and got it. But I don't think she will ever. I mean, she's in her sixties, and she still thinks she has a spirit horse that guides her in her artwork. And boy, she makes some wonderful artwork. I, you can't deny that. I'm I'm not going to create artwork. I don't have a spirit horse. <laughs> I don't know. If she needs her spirit horse. Could she do it as a scientist? I don't know. But Every time you say spirit horse, I just keep thinking of that animated movie from DreamWorks back in the 90s called Spirit. <laughs> like that's the only where that's <laughs> like that's that's where my brain goes when you keep saying spirit horse. <laughs> All right. Well, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> All right, I'm fine. Is is making you make great art? Okay. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Go for it. Yep. Well, that's great. All right, well, Carl, you're up. Yeah, you know, we maybe we have time for just one more question, and then we better wrap up. Um, so let's see here. We have several more, uh, but we can continue them in the Hangout as well. Um, but uh, one question that someone asked is, um, how do you deal with family members who accuse you of being infected with the atheist virus rather than the God virus? <laughs> Oh, that religion will, and it doesn't matter what you do. Religion will always try to take whatever you do and turn it against you. That's just, that's just a fact of life. So yeah. I, I, first of all, don't argue with them. Arguing gets you nowhere and it, it can give a rebound effect where they actually become more staunch. Don't argue with them. Use, you know, if you, the most I would say as well, I just, I don't, I don't believe in any gods. It's that simple. It's it's not a virus. It's not an infection. I, I don't believe in Hindu gods. I don't believe in Muslim gods. I don't believe in Christian gods. So um, you happen to have your God. Good for you, but I don't have any. I don't need a God. That would be the most I would say. If they want to start talking about atheist viruses, they'd have to find 
they'd have to help us find the rituals and the holy books and the songs, you know. We just don't have a very good uh, memeplex for our atheist. Athe if there was an atheist virus, our memeplex is pretty bad. Theirs is much better developed, so. Oh, we need to work on our music, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Dan Barker's been working on that for a long time and other people like, um, oh, our friend in Australia. <laughs> oh gosh what's her name gail if i'm forgetting she's been to my house uh, she shelly 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 siegel right i love her and, and we got to be sure and try and of course she's here in the states now i forget she's not in australia anymore other any other questions or are we going to move on well, to the we, hangout i think it's probably about time to move on to the hangout um are you gonna have time to stick around for any of the hangout yeah, i'd like to I'd stick around for 20 minutes or so and then i'm gonna go crash i'm super tired Perfect. All right, well, then we will save the rest of our questions for the Hangout. So if anybody had one that we didn't get to, hold that thought. We'll be right there. Um, and we'll just wrap up real quick and move on to that. But thank you again, Dr. Ray, for coming and talking to us about this topic. It is so timely, as you mentioned uh, lately. It's always great to have a, a refresher on this one and continue to see um, how it, it seems to ring true <laughs> still. So thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you for, for kicking us off again um, after our little break. And uh, we'll be back here again next week. Same time, same channel, same place. Um, and we'll be talking about um, actually a great follow-on uh, to this topic that we had tonight. We'll be talking about skepticism and critical thinking. Uh, and Rob Palmer... Rob Palmer will be joining us to discuss the application of skepticism and critical thinking to supernatural and paranormal beliefs. And he'll go over several common paranormal or supernatural beliefs that are frequently entertained by religious people as well as some non-religious people still. So be sure and bring your questions about that for Rob because it's going to be more of an interactive Q&A style um, for at least part of the show. So we're definitely looking forward to hearing from him about that. And uh, Helen, do you want to talk about our, our social media? and things where people can find us yes so if you have not have enough had enough of rfrx because i know you haven't you want to know more so you need to go to our youtube channel all of, um all of our previous conversations guests um presentations are on our rfrx um youtube channel so please go check that out also do you have any topical questions comments um hate mail you want to tell us how awesome we are please go to our rfrx at recovering recovering from religion.org send us an email oh my cat <laughs> wanted to walk sorry about that anyway um please cut that out my cat but walking across the um screen that'd be great <laughs> we'll we'll see yeah okay or the cat but you can keep up the cat butt i don't care <laughs> also too you can um, visit our blog where um people have submitted their stories um deconversion processes all the type of stuff so go to our blog also too you can um go to our our podcast where previous episodes of um when dr del ray did a podcast back in the day um previous episodes are up there you can listen to him talk more about these topics on our podcast so please go there also too we are on the social medias so we are in the modern age people so go see us on the facebook on the twitter on the instagram on the tiktoks do that too also sign up for your newsletter so you want to get some more recovering from religion news please set up for our newsletter you can find out about our meetup groups what's going on um it may be someone special is going to do an appearance on your favorite podcast show and you can find out about it there so please do that as well and that it is so we're going to move on to our feedback poll which Kara is going to introduce and i am out have a great week y'all You'll see me in the hangout. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, Helen. We're going to bring back the lovely, fantastic, and amazing Gail Jordan to give us some closing thoughts. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, everybody. Daryl, what a great presentation. I heard this presentation when Daryl first began to give it 10 or 12 years ago, and I was so uh, astounded by what the science shows and about the comparison of how we do get infected with that and how, as a child, when we don't have our defenses in place, 
kind of paralleling our natural immunities in place to be able to resist something like this, how much more vulnerable we are. Fabulous presentation. Karen, Helen, thank you for your co-hosting. Helen, for bringing, as someone put in the chat, the soul and the heat. We appreciate that. And Carl, congratulations and welcome to the RFR Leadership Family. We thank you for taking on this awesome responsibility to our troll stompers. We appreciate that. To David, our tech person, all these people working together. And if you would like to be part of this awesome family, we'd love to have you join us as a volunteer. It is as much fun as it looks like it is. We really enjoy one another. Um, the work is, uh, is as gratifying a thing to do as you will ever find to do. If you're looking for some place to plug in and volunteer, we'd love for you to consider that. Last thing I'm going to mention, thank you all for coming. If uh, next week sounds like it's a good presentation to, you can promote uh, a presentation about skepticism and critical thinking without bashing religion. It's a little softer topic. Uh, if you want to help us by promoting it on your own social media, reposting, retweeting, that kind of thing. This one is not, um, some are easier than others to promote to our circle of friends and family. And so if, you're, if your social media is public and you get a little pushback, if you post in some of that, this is a good one for you to help repost. And it, and it allows people to know that we're here and think about what we've drawn and what we get out of these presentations. And someone you know in your circle might appreciate it as well and get something out of it everyone enjoy the hangout thank you for coming back thank you for finding us after our three-week hiatus and we will see you next week <laughs>